Today is week three of our prayer practice. Um, you, uh, if you've been around, you'll know that we've been taking four weeks uh, to get into the practice of prayer. And prayer is, prayer at the end of the day, actually the simplest definition of prayer is that prayer is all of our lives with God. It's not just about asking him for stuff. It's not like a laundry list of, 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 of wishes like you might send to Santa for Christmas. But prayer is about all of our life with God. But the practice of prayer is all about setting aside special time to connect with him in a variety of different ways. And so we've been looking over over the last couple of weeks at that. Today's week three, and then we'll finish up with next four, uh, week four uh, next week. Hopefully you guys had a wonderful experience in prayer uh, this week. If you didn't, that's okay. It's all part of the process of, of, of growth and development. It really is. And this week is a turning point in our prayer practice because today we shift from speaking to listening. Yeah, keep oh. going. That's okay, you. I thought when it said slide, no. there was a video. So many people never actually get to this bit. I'm very guilty of this. We just end up being like a monologue rather than a dialogue. But before we, uh, we jump in and we begin, um, if you have your uh, companion guide with you, grab that out. If you don't have one, we'll bring one over to you uh, in a little bit. But uh, if you are able to do the practice reflection uh, from last week, turn to there. Uh, but the, the questions are going to be on the screen as well. Uh, we're just going to get into some small groups in just a moment and go over these questions. Okay, so number one, what aspect of last week's exercises was most difficult for you? Gratitude, lament, or asking? Question two, do you have any stories of answered prayer or even unanswered prayer? Mm. Those are okay as well. And number three, what did you sense God doing in you as you prayed? So if you weren't here last week, that's okay. Just in, in the groups, just try to answer the questions kind of more in general terms. Like, in general, as you pray, what's kind of more challenging for you? For you? Gratitude, lament, or asking? And just, just to define what those things mean again, gratitude is talking to God about all the good stuff in your life and in the world. Lament is talking to God about all the evil stuff in your life and in the world. And um, an asking, petition in the session, is asking God to make good on his promises to correct the evil and to promote the good in our lives and in the world. Okay. Just, uh, just before her death, Mother Teresa made a, a rare TV appearance on 60 Minutes. And uh, she was asked the question by Dan Rather, who was, who was, who was the host, the interviewer, he said, when you pray to God, what do you say to him? A mother Teresa responded, I don't say anything, I listen. And she was referring to a stage of prayer that sadly many followers of Jesus never step into. But for those who do, it's a whole other dimension of life with God. Over these four weeks, we're walking through four different dimensions or, or stages of prayer. We started out with week one with talking to God. I'm talking a lot about pre-made prayers and using the words of other people to pray. Last week, we, Rachel talked about talking with God, kind of developing our, our conversation onto, onto another level. Today, we're going to be looking at listening, with, uh, at listening to God and then next week, simply being with God. But so up for this week is listening to God. And those four stages, are, they're not a linear progression. It's not like we do the first one, then we move on from that, we stop doing the first one, and then we do the second one, and then we stop and we move on to the, the third one. Um, it's, not, it's not linear like that. We don't graduate from any one of them at, at any time. But most of us start prayer like a child by speaking other people's words. Like Rachel talked about, we learn as children to speak by repeating other people. Say mama, say dada, you know, say milk, whatever it is that we, we, we might want. That's how we begin. And that's a very simple but easy way to start out when we start to pray, by praying words that other people have written for us. But as we mature, we begin to pray our own words. But in time, 
hopefully our desire grows not just to speak to God, but actually to listen to what God's saying as well, to hear his voice, to move from a monologue to a dialogue, as Zoe said earlier. Now that raises all sorts of questions about what exactly do we mean by God's voice? What do we mean when we talk about hearing God's voice? But actually this desire that we have for that is a desire that the Holy Spirit puts inside of us. Gary Brashears says, Learning to hear God's voice is the single most important task of a disciple of Jesus. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 10, whether that you have a paper Bible, a phone, whatever, the, uh, the, the scripture is going to also appear up on the screen as well. But John chapter 10, and we're going to start at verse 2. This is Jesus talking. He says, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When, he's brought them out, all his, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus is saying that all those who are truly his sheep, which really is a word picture for his disciples, both his disciples back then and his disciples still today, will know his voice and they will follow it. For for Jesus discipleship, being apprentices of Jesus, is not just about the learning of teaching or the following of a set of practices. It's an interactive, dynamic, living relationship. In, uh, in, in the book of Luke, in, in chapter 10, we read about Mary, one of Jesus' disciples. And it says that she just sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. And to sit at the feet was, was an idiom for discipleship in the first century. But what is Mary doing sitting at Jesus' feet? She's listening. She's paying close attention to what he's saying. And really, a disciple of Jesus, who is one who is found regularly sitting at his feet, listening to what he has to say. But this idea of, of prayer as listening to God isn't original to Jesus. It's a central theme that runs all the way through the Bible. The last uh, two weeks, we particularly were looking at the Lord's Prayer because it's really the central prayer from the way of Jesus. But um, back when we visited Israel in about 2009, 2010, Every day as we traveled around Israel on our, on our bus, we took the time and we prayed every day an even more ancient prayer than the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that Jesus himself would have grown up praying. Because actually for a millennium, this prayer had been the anchor prayer of the Hebrew people. They prayed it three times a day. They would write it on, on small scraps of paper and put it in a small box called a phylactery. And they would bind it. They would strap it to their heads during daily prayer. They would pin these pieces of paper to the doorposts of their houses. Like this prayer was central to what it meant to be a Jew. It's found in Deuteronomy 6. And it's called the Shema. And it's named after the opening word of of this prayer. Hear, O Israel, or in Hebrew, Shema Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Shema, hear, it has has two meanings. It means to hear, obviously, but it also means to obey. It means to hear it means to obey. Think about when a parent is talking to their child and they say to their child, listen to me. 
They don't just mean make eye contact and pay attention to what I'm saying, do they? They mean do what I'm asking you to do. That's what a parent means when they say, listen to me. And this right here is the father in this prayer saying to his children, listen to me, obey me, and it's all going to go well with you. The Shema became the the center point of, of Israel's prayer life. In fact, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important command in all of the scripture, what does he do? He quotes the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. For Jesus to listen and to obey is the single most important thing in all of the spiritual life. It's really actually one way that we can summarize all of Christian discipleship. What it means to be an apprentice of Jesus. It means to listen and it means to obey. Now, many of us have mixed feelings about the word obey, don't we? It goes against our be true to yourself culture. But a disciple is one who's always listening out for Jesus' voice in order to go out and do what he says, in order to go out and obey Jesus' word. Jesus' final words to his disciples in Matthew 28 will go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Learning to hear Jesus' voice is one of the great tasks of a disciple. Learning to obey his voice is an even greater task. And in order to do that, in order to obey the voice of God, we have to come to believe, we have to come to trust that actually obedience is not an obstacle on the path to happiness. It is the path to happiness. Doing what Jesus says rather than what you want to do is not a hindrance to you living life to the full. It is the way that you get to live life to the full. Ignatius of Loyola defines sin as unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. Until we come to trust in the deepest part of our hearts that what God wants for us is only our deepest happiness, we're not even going to desire to hear God's voice. La, 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 can't hear. (laughs) We're not going to just want to only hear his voice, much less we're going to want to obey it if we don't come to that realization, if we don't come to that belief, if we don't come to that trust, that all he wants for us is our deepest happiness. But once we do come to trust that, once we come to trust that Jesus actually has good intentions towards us, the driving aim of our, of our life gets transformed and increasingly becomes to listen out for his voice. You know, many people only attempt to hear the voice of God when they face a major decision and they're scared of the future. Like, God, I don't want to make a mistake. Or, God, I'm afraid. Like, I need some comfort. That's when we turn to God and we want to hear his voice. But this isn't, you know, really so much an attempt to listen and obey. It's kind of a bit more like divination or magic. It's an attempt to bypass pain. But when we sit down to listen to Jesus, our goal is not to to try and get some divine fortune cookies about which way our life's going to go. It's to follow the direction of the good shepherd, wherever it is he's going to lead us. Even when, like in Jesus' own story, the Father calls us towards pain, not away from pain. The goal is to listen and to obey. But the question, big question really is how, right? That's what we're all asking, how? How do we hear God's voice? And the reality is, there's not really any one-size-fits-all formula for how to discern God's voice. 
because God comes to each of us within the own, the own, our own contours of our own lives, you know, our personality, our background, our stage of life. He speaks to us in different ways, to different people at different times. In fact, we, we likely actually already hear God way more than we realize. Just like the story of young Samuel in the temple, if you've ever read that. He's hearing the voice of God, but he doesn't even realize that it's God. We may just not recognize that we're hearing God speak to us quite yet. Because God does speak, but he often speaks in more subtle ways than we might like him to. So what I want to do is I want to give you six ways that we hear God's voice. The first is Jesus. The second is Scripture. The third is Circumstances. The fourth is desire, the fifth is the prophetic, and the sixth is listening prayer. You guys got that? Okay, message over, done. No, (laughs) oh no, we're going to talk about each of them. (laughs) The first and foremost is Jesus. Jesus is the way that we hear God's voice. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus is called the Word. Now, modern Christians today, we tend to refer to this, the Bible, as the Word of God. But when you read the Word in the New Testament, it's usually referring to Jesus. And it's referring to the good news of his kingdom, not the Bible. Hearing God's voice begins and ends with Jesus, the Word. All the other ways that God communicates with us come through Jesus and they point back to Jesus. It starts and ends with Jesus. But that said, God also does speak to us in other ways. He speaks to us through Scripture, through the Bible. You know, some of the Bible is the written record of God's audible voice from heaven, such as the Ten Commandments in the Torah or the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospels. Every, you know, every time that, if, you know, like in my Bible right here, it has the words of Jesus in red. I mean, that is the record of the audible voice of God here on earth, right here and now. But much of the Bible is, is God speaking through the minds of human writers. But all of it is a way that we can listen and we can obey God. The Dutch theologian Herman Bevink He says, Holy Scripture is not an arid story or an ancient chronicle, but the ever-living, eternally youthful word which God now and always issues to his people. It is the eternally ongoing speech of God to us. Now, there are all sorts of ways to approach Scripture. But a long time ago, Monks developed one way that's especially designed to hear God's voice through Scripture. They called it Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina. And it's a Latin phrase, and it means spiritual reading. And what you do with Lectio Divina is you just read a short passage of Scripture, slowly, quietly, prayerfully, And you ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate a particular word or a phrase or an idea that he wants to speak to you through that scripture. It's different from Bible study because Bible study asks, well, what did that text mean to the people who it was written to in the first place? And then secondly, how do we apply that to our life today? That's what Bible study does. But Lectio asks, how is God coming to me personally through this text? Now, we've got to be careful with doing this because we don't want to manipulate the Bible or we don't want to, definitely don't want to allow Satan, who's called in the Word of God the deceiver, to manipulate the Bible 
which is what he tried to do with Jesus in the desert. You remember when Jesus was, was, was being tempted and Satan came to him and he quoted scripture to him, but he quoted scripture out of context and he quoted scripture in a, day, in a way to order to manipulate it for his own purposes. So we don't want to do that ourselves and we don't want to give the enemy space to do that as well. But what we're doing in this is that we're not asking for a new meaning for the scripture. We're just simply asking what aspect of the original meaning the Holy Spirit wants to impress into our life in that moment. Does that make sense? You know, this way of reading the Bible has become an earphone to God's voice for countless followers of Jesus down through the ages. Now, a lot of people, a lot of Christians stop right here with those first two ways that we hear the voice of God through Jesus and through Scripture. Or at least they act like a long time ago, God said a whole bunch of important things and people wrote them down and ever since then, heaven's been silent. Now the Bible is finished. We're not adding anything else to the Bible. Canon's closed on the Bible. But heaven is anything but silent. God is still speaking. So let me offer you a few more ways that he does that today. The third way that he speaks to us is through our circumstances. This is an area where there's a whole wide spectrum of thought on what that actually means and what that looks like. Because some followers of Jesus emphasize God's sovereignty or his rule over the events of our life. And others give more space to to human free will and demonic rebellion against God's rule. But really all Christians agree that at least some of the circumstances in our lives are God's voice, his shepherding voice coming to us to lead us and to guide us. Opportunities, closed doors, limitations, giftings, relationships, when and, and, and where and to whom that we're born, the various situations we find ourselves in, God is often in those circumstances, coaxing us forward by his voice. As Paula Darcy once said, God comes to us disguised as our life. I love that. That's so good. God comes to us disguised as our life. So learning to discern how God's speaking to you through the events of your life is a key part of learning to hear his voice. Another way uh, that we discern God's voice is by listening both carefully and critically to the desires of our heart. You know, much of secular culture tells us, just be true to yourself. Just follow your heart and it will lead you to happiness. But at best, that's a half-truth. The writers of the Bible have a far more sophisticated view of desire. They tell us that the heart's complex that it's full of both beauty and ugliness. It's full of light and shadow. Some of our desires, if we left them unchecked, would lead us over a cliff. So we don't want to pay attention too much to those kind of desires. But other desires that we experience are actually God at work in our hearts. Generally speaking, desire is a good indication of design. God made birds want to fly and he made fish want to swim because that's what he made them to do. Now, of course, our heart's been infected by the disease of sin. And so we have to sift through our desires to find God's desire within us. But overall, desire is one of those key ways that we hear God's voice. So if you feel a desire for something different or new in your life, Listen for God in that desire. If you feel a pull in your heart towards a career path or towards a new friendship or or something else, listen for God's will in that. It may be a way that he is speaking to you. God also speaks to us through one another. In the New Testament, this falls under the umbrella of the prophetic. Prophecy you know, is not primarily predicting the future or pronouncing judgment. Most of it is what the Apostle Paul calls strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. Often, you know, it's, it's as simple as opening your imagination 
to God before you pray over a person. I'm waiting to see if, if a word or a phrase or a line from the Bible or, or a picture begins to form in your mind's eye. And then offering it to that person as a possible word from God to be tested against Scripture and to be tested in community as well. We don't prophesy in the sense that we say, thus saith the Lord. We say, hey, I, I get the impression that maybe God is saying this to you. Or I see this picture in my mind. I think it's for you. Maybe with a little bit of interpretation of what we feel it is. But we, we leave it to people to make up to do with what it is that they feel like God's doing to it with them. Sometimes if you ever received a prophetic word and, and you feel like, oh man, I, I, I just got to get moving on this. I have to, I have to, I have to you know, someone gives you a word about you know, moving to China and you're like, you're booking tickets before they've even finished the prophetic word. It's like, whoa, hang on a minute. How do you know that's God? We need to take a breath. How does that line up with what God's spoken to you in the past? How does that line up with the desires of your heart and the circumstances that you're experiencing? How does it line up with Scripture? What do the people closest to you think about that call? One of the most helpful things I ever uh, heard on the prophetic was uh, a friend of, of our church family, Mark DuPont. And he said, a prophetic word is a springboard into a pool of prayer. The first thing we do when someone gives us a prophetic word is we pray about it. We take it to God. We rest in it. We, we sit and we determine, is that God and what actually does it mean? God also speaks to us similarly through dreams when we're asleep and in visions, which is you know, kind of like a waking dream. Some people experience that a lot more than others. And if you don't experience God speaking to you through dreams or visions, that's okay. But if you do, pay attention to that. If it's something you want to experience, ask God if he would speak to you in that way. It's okay to ask that. So prophecy really is, is how we speak God's voice or we bring God's voice to one another. But on the other side of, of, of prophecy and the prophetic is number six, which is listening prayer. Listening prayer is simply waiting quietly for God to speak directly into your mind or into your heart. Because the Holy Spirit is within you. God has access to your inner life. People often wonder, like, why does God not speak audibly? Why do I not hear the booming voice of God telling me what to do? If God wants to communicate to me, why would he not do it that way? Well, the answer is there's actually no simple answer to that question. But one reason is that God doesn't need to. God has direct access to your mind and to your imagination. I mean, think about it. What is communication at the end of the day? Communication is guided thought. If I say to you, think about a sunset, what are you doing right now? You're thinking about a sunset. By listening to me, you are trusting me to guide your mind. God doesn't need to speak in an audible voice to guide our minds. He can reach directly in there and direct our thoughts and our feelings and our desires by the Holy Spirit. You know, we often have a thought come to mind and we're like, is that God? No, 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 that, it's just in my head. Well, of course it's in your head. Just because it's in your head, why does it not make it God? That's how he speaks to us, in our heads, through our minds. Your head is where thoughts are formed, where emotions are created, where ideas are born. All of life is in our head, in a sense, in that life is an experience of consciousness. Now, all of our thoughts, just like prophecy, um, need to be tested and weighed to determine their source. But the truth remains that God can and will speak directly into our thought life. I mean, think about Alexander Graham Bell for a moment. Why would Alexander Graham Bell mail a letter to a friend when he could pick up the telephone that he himself invented and call him. 
Why would God speak audibly to us if he can guide our thoughts into his word and his will directly? Now, of course, like Elijah in the cave in 1 Kings 19, most of us experience God's voice as a small, still voice, not a deafening internal yell. That, that Hebrew phrase that we find in, in 1 Kings 19 can be translated a gentle whisper or even the sound of gentle silence. So therefore, much of learning to, to develop a, a, a rich prayer life with God is learning to quiet our mind and our body. Because our mind is jumpy and distractible and it's prone to anxiety and it's prone to anger and the world gets noisier and noisier and noisier and we have to learn to quiet the outer noise and we have to learn to quiet the inner noise and just to sit before God and there wait for his voice. In prayer, we're learning not just to speak to Jesus but to listen to Jesus, to hear his voice and to obey. Now, all of these ways, all of those six ways that we hear God's voice require what the New Testament calls discernment. Discernment. Discernment is the ability to sift through ideas and events and thoughts and feelings and clearly see what is my own imagination or worse, what is my flesh or sin what is the evil one? What is Satan trying to speak to me? And what is actually God's voice coming through? Because without discernment, it's really easy for us to get wildly off base or even worse, to open up our mind to the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil himself. We don't want to do that. Discernment's absolutely necessary as we learn to hear God's voice. And this sermon is it's a, it's a work of the Spirit in our life, the work of the Holy Spirit within us, but it's also a skill that we develop over time. And it's also something that we do in community, not something we just do on our own. But again, growing in discernment and with it, our ability and our willingness to hear Jesus' voice is a key task of discipleship. Jesus said later on in that same passage that we started with, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. So how do we grow in the ability to discern Jesus' voice from all the other voices in our heads? How do we do that? How do we tell them apart? How do we get better at doing that? Well, the answer is actually simple. We do it exactly the same way that we learn to discern the voice of our best friend or our spouse or our parents when we're babies by long hours of listening. Our brains eventually come to recognize almost immediately a person's voice. Think about that saying, I'd know that voice anywhere. You wouldn't say that about someone you'd never met before, would you? You'd say that about someone that you've spent a long, long time listening to. That's how we come to recognize a voice. And we don't necessarily think about it. We don't think why. We don't think about the pitch or the intonation or the way they form certain vowel sounds. or We don't, we don't break down the linguistics, do we? We just know it because we're so used to it. And it's the same with God. We don't have to overthink it. The more that we listen to his voice, the more and the easier it's going to be for us to discern when it's him speaking or not. You know, look, guys, you can do this. If a sheep, which is not known to be among the most intelligent of animals, can learn to recognize their shepherd's voice and distinguish it from the voice of the thief and the rod, then surely we can do the same. We, uh, we, we taught on this back at, at the beginning of the year. And like Jesus is not just, you know, telling a clever story about super intelligent sheep here. Sheep can literally recognize their owner's voice. They will obey and follow their voice, and they will not follow the voice of someone that is not their owner. If they're kind of dumb, <laughs> and they're able to do that, surely we can do it. There's hope for us after all. <laughs> 
So our exercises for this coming week are really all about learning to quiet your mind and listen for God's voice. But here's the key thing. Hearing God's voice takes more than just a quiet mind. It also takes a surrendered heart. Because after all, why would God speak to us if we're not going to pay any attention? Why would he bother to speak to us if he knows full well that we're not going to heed his voice? So like Mary, we have to begin by sitting at Jesus' feet, listening for what he has to say. Amen. Well, we're going to take a, 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 a few moments to have a little conversation about, the, uh, about the, the, the teaching. And we've got three questions for you. We're just going to get back into those same groups uh, and uh, go over those three questions to do that. So question one. Have you ever tried to listen to God's voice before and how have you done it? And then question two. What fears or hopes does this type of prayer bring up in your heart? And number three. What's the primary way you hear God's voice in your life? Okay, so now it's time to put this all into practice, people. We've got two exercises for you coming up, and you can find them starting on page 48 of your companion guidebooks. Okay. And number one is what Rich was talking about earlier, is the Lectio Divina. As he described it, I was like, oh, I've done that for years. I didn't know it had a name. There you go. So there you go. So read a passage of scripture slowly and prayerfully and listen to God's voice to you. Um, simply pick a passage of scripture, anyone you want. There's some suggestions in the, in the book. Um, and, and get somewhere quiet and distraction free. Take some deep breaths and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your mind and your heart. So there are four basic steps which are up on the screen and of course they're in the guidebook. Step one is to read. Pick a passage of your choice Read it slowly and prayerfully. Pay special attention to any words or phrases or ideas that jump out to you or that move you emotionally or maybe deeply resonate with you. And then number two is to reflect, to reread the passage again, slowly. Um, this time, pause over the words or, phra or phrase or phrases that were highlighted um, to you during your first reading and then meditate on them. Um, turn them over in your mind. Like, imagine there's something delicious you're eating. Savor them. Uh, step three is to respond. Pray your impressions back to God. You, you can use your own words or just simply pray the text of the scripture directly to him. And then rest. Take a few minutes in silence to breathe deeply and rest in God's loving word for you. Also, awesome. that's exercise one. That's Lectio Divina. And then exercise two is what we were talking about with listening prayer. Again, you know, get somewhere quiet and distraction-free, and then take some time to breathe. Take a minute or two just to breathe slowly and deeply, clearing your mind to receive God's word to you. You might want to just simply pray, Father or Jesus or come Holy Spirit, as you inhale and you exhale each breath. And then silence. That's a really hard one. Ask God to silence the voice of the enemy in your mind, to clear the air around you, to shield you and guard you, your imagination. And then step three is just simply ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And number four, open your mind and heart to listen. The easy one. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 tells us our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit is within you. Um, and has direct access to your imagination. So wait quietly with a surrendered heart. And so, you know, in that moment, the Holy Spirit might speak to you in a bunch of different ways, through a word or a phrase, through a thought, through a picture in your mind, through a feeling in your heart, a sensation in your body. Any of those could, could be the way that he wants to connect and communicate with you in any given moment. So if nothing comes to you, don't judge yourself or get angry with God. Just thank him for his love for you and try again another time. Be sure you weigh what you hear against scripture and in community. Awesome. So Lectio Divina and then Listening Prayer are our two exercises. And in each week we have our REACH exercise for those of you who want to go further. Um, our REACH exercise for this week is the Prayer of Examine which is a, 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 a powerful way to pray through your day, reflect on your day with God. So as usual, there are instructions and a video tutorial in the guidebook. 
for that, for the prayer of examine. Um, in the guidebook, you'll also find some recommended reading for this practice, um, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools by Tyler Staten, and episode three of the Prayer Practice Podcast from Practicing the Way. Awesome. And then finally, don't forget the prayer reflection on uh, page 56. Hopefully you get a chance to complete that before we come back together next time. And then you can share that in your groups.